Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Ahlul Bayt Live on Ahlul Bayt TV. My name is Amr Hussain. I'll be your host for this evening. And the topic for this evening is uh, a discussion regarding the show, the Channel 4 show, which was shown last week um, called Islam, the Untold Story. <clears throat> Many of you may have seen this uh, uh, documentary, which was shown on Channel 4, which um, tried to plot the history of Islam and uh, through historic um, means. Uh, the, the journalist or the historian involved um, came up with a number of uh, conclusions which um, to some in the Islamic world were not acceptable. So uh, on our show tonight we're going to uh, discuss the various topics that came up and the issues and the concerns that we have of, uh, of varying shows such as this. Um, as ever, it's a call-in show, so please do feel free to call in the number that you see on the screen. Um, you can also uh, put any questions forward on our Facebook page and also on our Twitter account at Ahlubayt TV. It'd be interesting to see people's views and opinions on how the show was, how they uh, perceived the show, and also how they were able to deal with the, the aftermath of the show, if you like. With me tonight, I have uh, not one but two um, respected guests. Um, first, we have said Muhammad Radhavi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. And uh, we also have uh, Sheikh Jafar Ladak with us. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, <coughs> thank you for joining us this evening. Um, <coughs> just to kick off, uh, what I mean, obviously, you've seen the show. Um, what were your, your first impressions at the end of the show? When what what you thought of the the conclusion of it? I'm saying. Uh, well, I tried to see the show, but uh, my flash player was not working. Uh -huh. and, uh, but I managed to read several reports and comments about it, and the questions that were raised by uh, many uh, different uh, scholars and uh, students and Muslims, even some Orientalists, or Orientalists have uh, mm. mentioned some points and they actually disagreed with the points that uh, were raised in this uh, show. And this is not the first attempt. If you look at the history of it, you would find uh, this is an old story that mm. has been uh, repeated again. So uh, it's, it's nothing uh, new. and. Uh, Although, from a point of view, I would agree with the author that uh, what he's trying to uh, narrate and say is the story or history written by the oppressors. Mm. If you look at the history written by, I mean, this is one of the big problems we have with the history, that uh, all the histories are written by oppressors, not oppressed people. Yeah. Uh, for example, we as a, uh, followers of Abu Bayt alayhi wa salam, believe in uh, authenticity of uh, Ahlul Bayt wasalam. we accept what Ahlul Bayt wasalam, say and narrate and we accept their word as final word uh, because we believe that uh, they wouldn't say but what uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said and what what was fact so if we depended on the teachings of Ahlul Bayt wasalam, of course we would come to the right conclusion what happened what didn't happen yeah. and what is right and what is wrong uh, but unfortunately the problem, biggest problem is that uh, the histories are written by the oppressors, not oppressed people. Yeah, sure. Um, Sheikh Jaffa, what was your kind of immediate um, view of it after you watched the show? I felt um, a little bit let down by Channel 4, to be mm. honest with you. Um, <coughs> being a mainstream broadcaster, you know, you, you expected a, a degree of journalistic credibility to come, to come involved. Mm. Um, and, you know, when you look at uh, how someone creates a documentary, there needs to be um, a degree of balance. There needs to be a balance of panelists or participants. I didn't think that was there. Um, to me, it became quite clear very early on that um, Mr. Holland had already had, he already had his view and he wanted to create the history around that view. Mm. Uh, you know, as in someone who's in academia, somebody who is supposed to be a historian, it's the other way around, you know, you, you need to look at the evidence, become completely objective mm -hmm. and then come to a justified conclusion. Um, and I think the worst thing about the show um, was that, uh, you know, there was four panelists in addition to, mm -hmm. to, to Mr. Holland. Sayyid Hussein Nasr was one of them. 
and he, um, may Allah bless him for being a wonderful um, uh, academic, but he's not a historian, he's not a historiographer, he's a philosopher in his own field. So if you've got three panelists who are historians, who have written on this subject, who are aware of this subject, you need to bring someone who is able to, to, to balance the view. Um, and I don't think Sid Hussein um, either presented the case in the best of ways, or he was given the opportunity to. Or and if he was, then it wasn't edited in a way where his answers mm. came forth. Um, and I felt a little bit let down by Channel 4. I expected just a little bit more from them in this regard. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting you said that there's a, it needed a balanced view, um, which is what you would expect from any sort of documentary or research. Um, but, I mean, we're going to explore some of the main points that they, uh, that they brought up um, in the show. But, and it, you know, to me, it seemed that there wasn't much of a balance, um, which hopefully we can put right. Um, <clears throat> so if we just take some of the, um, the, the kind of main points that, the, um, that Mr. Holland brought up um, regarding his, uh, his research. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the f uh, points that he made was um, the first biography um, of the Prophet and a lot of the kind of traditions that came after the Prophet were made many many years after in you know you're saying uh, 100 or 200 years after yeah. the Prophet was around um, <clears throat> I mean from if you look at it from one point of view he's uh, he's got a point that you know he was around a, a religion was brought to the world and there was nothing written about it for 200 years how can we explain this we can't say it was nothing written about it because if he, if he had referred to authentic books that we have, uh, he would have found plenty of references. But he, while he's sitting in the library, uh, he, he, he ignores all the uh, authentic uh, proof or historian, uh, historical work. And uh, I would like to add a point regarding Hussein Nasser. I, I was told by one of his close friends that uh, he may have said a lot Mm. But Channel 4 and British media has the habit of editing. Mm. They presented what they wanted to show to the world. Sure. Uh, because Hussein Nasser, although he's not a historian, but he's very careful uh, on these subjects. But he, and it was edited. I mean, mm. this is what the British media wanted to show to the, to the people. It's not in their interest to, to show what yeah. uh, has been said, really. Mm. And uh, I mean, do you think, Jaffa, that is uh, the the sources that they were used? I mean, his his claim of there were no, no kind of um, literature, biographies, any um, relation to the Prophet for hundred or two hundred years after, um, you know, as we as we're aware that this is not actually the case. So uh, where where is he where is he missed out the? I mean, the if you if you look at his, you've got two principal concepts that he wants to present. Um, Holland, the first thing he said was that. Um, Islam, or the Holy Prophet of Islam, came and created this religion. Um, and he did so because he had some sort of theological debate that he wanted to include amongst uh, the Jewish and the Christian views. In the decades after the Prophet uh, had passed away from this world, وسلم, when the Arabs had conquered vast parts of the uh, Arabian lands and beyond, that's when they formalized this religion underneath these views. Based on this, because, according to his view, that biographies and documents hadn't been classified for up to 200 years after the death of the Prophet, then there is no reason for us to accept them because they are biased and Islamic sources. Mm. So, from a historical perspective, we have to ask the primary question whether a historian can completely reject something that is from a, an Islamic source just because it's from an Islamic source. If it's from an Islamic source, does it make it biased? Well, the, the fact of the matter is that those Islamic scholars who are masters of hadith sciences and Rajal, they have gone through um, these books of traditions with such a fine tooth comb that they know each and every biographer. They know exactly where he was born, where she was born, what their personality was like, which grouping, which sect they were from. And with these calculations, they can determine as to whether a tradition is biased towards a group or whether it's an objective mm -hmm. research. He failed to demonstrate as to why he would reject Islamic sources.
fine, if you want to reject them as a historian, you're entitled to. But provide me with evidence as to why you want to do that and why no, but no other researcher does that. Mm. That's the first thing. And then in regards to the second issue, in regards to the 200-year the, the gap, um, let us assume that there is a 200-year gap. We would dispute this, and we say that there's enough historical material from the Islamic traditions to dispute this, as Sayyid just mentioned. What about from the academic perspective? What about from the secular? And um, you will find within even the secular world, there is enough sources to have mentioned the Holy Prophet of Islam by name, to have mentioned his history. I have read certain historical reports just only a few um, decades after the advent of Islam, talking about the defraying of zakat and how zakat used to be implemented around the Muslim ummah. Now, if that was something that um, had been appointed at the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam, demonstrated by him, practiced amongst the entire ummah from the point of Yemen all the way to Palestine, all the way to the northern points of the, of the ummah, how could someone who is not a Muslim, only a few years after the Prophet of Islam, record that these events were taking place by the Prophet and after the Prophet. Mm -hmm. My question to Mr. Holland is why he did he choose to ignore these sources. In a balanced debate, you would bring them forth and you would try to disprove them. And then someone like Sid Hussein Nasser would come and give a balanced opinion. But none of this was shown, none of this was demonstrated. And, and again, it doesn't um, provide us any um, identity towards a balanced argument and that's the problem with his, his statement mm. that we have to reject anything that comes in the first 200 years from Islam mm. because it's, it's biased. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the, um, the points you raised was, uh, was regarding the, the word or the location, um, Becca, um, and the, uh, the, where the actual geographical lo location of this is and, um, and he, he played a lot on the, the fact that there was nothing to say Mecca had any sort of significance, the, the city of Mecca had any sort of significance. Um, Sheikh Jaffa, could you give us a little bit of a background on the meaning of the word or, or Mecca and also about the location of it? I mean, the first thing is that, um, with respect to Holland, that um, he played on some words. He did very well in this, mm -hmm. in this section. What he did was that he suggested that the the word Makkah is only mentioned once in the Quran and then he said it's not mentioned at all in the Quran. Mm. So there is a discrepancy. If you watch the video very carefully, I think the editing should be checked because of the way he worded it. Anyway, he suggests or the way I understood it is that he is suggesting that the word Makkah isn't in the Quran whereas it is. But of course we also have this issue that as you stated that he uses the word Bakka because the word Bakka is also clearly mentioned in the Quran. We have um, the verse لَلَّ ذِي بِبَكَّةَ مُبَارَكًا وَهُدًا لِلْعَالَمِينَ So now from a historical perspective there are two reasons or at least in my humble research there are two main reasons as to why the word Bakka is used as opposed to was Makkah. The first one is that historically the words or the letter bear and mean was synonymous with each other at that point. So it wouldn't have made um, a difference as to whether it was used one or synonymously with each other. Right. More importantly, historically, the area Mecca or the city Mecca was called Bakka. Now, as we stated, Mr. Holland wants to reject that because that's from an Islamic source. But if it's not mentioned in a non-Islamic source, mm. you are obliged to take it from the yeah. only source that is available and then come and analyze it. Why was it historically that Mecca was called Bakka? According to one tradition, it is because the root word of this was Bukha. Bukha uh, means to cry or to wail. So the reason for this is after Ibrahim والسلام, built the Holy Kaaba again, after he reconstructed the Holy Kaaba, people would come for pilgrimage. Um, as the Holy Quran uh, tells him, that you should announce to mankind Hajj. You will see people flocking from every corner of the earth. So when Ibrahim والسلام, performed this action, people would come on pilgrimage towards Mecca or Bakka and they would circumambulate, they would perform tawaf around the Holy Kaaba and they would cry, they would wail. As such that area became known as Bakka because the root is Bukha that they used to wail and cry. Mm. And we know this is a fact because at the time of the pagans pre-Rasulullah the Quran says that they used to sing, dance and clap around the Kaaba. They continued this but in their own perverse way of bringing this into the pagan means. So Tom Holland completely rejected 
that uh, Bakr has any significance, claiming it might be somewhere else in Jordan or mm. somewhere else. The fact is that if you can't prove where Bakr is, but the Muslim sources show you where Bakr is, why are you rejecting the only historical sources available? Mm. Mm. You know, it's, it, for me, as a hist I'm not a historian. For me, if I'm analyzing history, I would really question as to how he came with this view. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, <coughs> So now we've got um, uh, a big section of the, the show. He talked about the Jews um, mm -hmm. and about Jerusalem and how the, the Jerusalem was the land God promised to the Jews. Um, and he also mentioned about how the invasion, etc. came. Could you said, shed some light on the, the whole, because he mentioned it quite a few times, that the Jerusalem is the land of the Jews, the land promised um, to the Jews by God. Can you give us a bit of, throw us a bit, a bit of light on that and whether, how um, authentic that is or how it fits into our, our belief? Well, we believe that we are followers of Ahl al-Kitab. I mean, uh, we are Ahl al-Kitab and the Christians are Ahl al-Kitab, the Jews are Ahl al-Kitab. Mm. So, uh, we, we, are we are bound to share a lot with the Same. Torah and uh, Injil and Zabur and all, mm. all the divine books. Uh, and this is one of the accusations that are made in history, that Prophet Muhammad Nauzubillah learned everything from a Jewish rabbi, mm. and then he, he came up with a, something called Quran, and uh, that's what it is. So uh, these are accusations, and uh, Quran, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in Holy Quran explained a lot of uh, uh, stories and uh, issues that were mentioned. Uh, previously or uh, misinterpreted later on. Mm. So, uh, as far as uh, Islamic teachings are concerned, as far, as far as the verses of Holy Quran are concerned, yes, I mean, Jews used to live there. We, we, we don't deny that. Mm. And yes, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, promised uh, a savior who would come. And uh, Christian, Jews and Muslims, they all believe in a savior. Mm. We are all waiting for a savior to come and uh, so, uh, when if if we if we find the uh, un what do you call undistorted uh, divine books of the previous mm. prophets, we would definitely discover that yes, th that promised land is not only promised for Jews; it's promised for the pious people. Right. So it could be Muslims, it could be Jews, it could be Christians. We are all promised that promised land, mm. and that's why the, when we have these demonstrations on quotes, there are some Jews who come and yeah. join with yeah. us. And they totally disagree with what uh, Zionists are doing there. I mean, they said, we are not supposed to uh, deliberately make this piece of land inherit mm -hmm. be inherited by the Jews. We have to wait for the right time. We have to wait for the promised Messiah to come. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Allah's promise is fulfilled. And of course, as a Muslim, we believe that uh, Jew, I mean, Jerusalem not only belongs to Christian Jews but belongs to all Muslims and mm. according to our teachings they are also partially Muslims they have submitted their will mm. to the will of God so they are partially Muslims so it will be given to the Muslims which includes all followers of divine faith awesome. okay thank you very much and um, we're gonna be going for a short break now of uh, about five minutes and um, please do uh, feel free to ring in and um, we're particularly interested in your views on uh, your impressions of the show and how you felt um, how you felt after watching it um, and in particular um, how you felt you could deal with uh, somebody questioning you about the, the topics that came up in the show. So please do feel free and um, we'll be back after the break. We'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum.